morning, everyone. Uh, if you'd stand and um, sing our first hymn, it's on page 131. Well, we welcome everybody this morning. Glad to see you out. And um, is there any announcements this morning? begin a Advent study, Bible study, over at the UCC Church this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, so uh, and there's some books in the back and a sign-up sheet if anybody's interested. Roger? Yes? Which church are we meeting at? The UCC to start out with. Okay, do I just announce this? Or do you... Mike? Bill and I got to meet our great-grandson for the first time yesterday and told him. Oh, good. I <laughs> they are really small. You didn't drop him, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't stand up with him. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead and announce The first Advent. Okay, this morning we're going to light our first Advent candle. Like part of my family to come up, they're going to help. <laughs> People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For the child has been born for us, the son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders. And he is named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Today we remember the prophet of old, who <clears throat> who demanded to be heard, who dared to speak of a child to come, unexpected liberator of the people, vulnerable incarnation of the holiest of holies, a new name for God. On this, Sunday, on this first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle as a symbol of 
the prophets who renew our faith and remind us of what may be. If you'd uh, stand for the call to worship. Mountains are all aglow with autumn's colors. Are you aware that God is there? Golden fields wave their, wave their praise to God's bountiful harvest. Are you aware that God is there? A flock of geese flies overhead. The leaves are turning yellow and red. The sweet smell of autumn is in the air. A prayer is answered, a gift is given. It's it is little, little things around us every day that make us lift our voices and say, Thank you, God, you gave your Son, and he is here. Thank you. Good morning. Pastor Donna and Ron are in Philadelphia with family for a memorial service this weekend, so keep them in our prayers as they're traveling. Do we have any uh, joys and concerns this morning? Yes, Barb. Um, we want to keep the family of Dennis Coons in our prayers because he passed away yesterday. Okay, the Coons family. Dennis passed away after a long struggle. Anyone else? Yes. Vicki Smith and her friend uh, um, Dusty Ashby. I don't know exactly what it is. But he had reversed shoulder surgery six weeks ago. He has not been able to move his shoulder at all. He has a follow up appointment this Wednesday. So if you want us to be here, Vicki and Doug. Yes? A birthday? A birthday boy? I guess he... 39, okay. We'll write that down. <laughs> Anyone else? She's seven. <laughs> and I just want to reiterate that it was a joy Thursday for our church to serve uh, about 85 meals to the Meals on Wheels for Thanksgiving. So that was a great experience, and I'm glad we all participated in that. If there's no other joys or concerns, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, God, we pray this morning for all in struggle with situations out of control or in the control of powers that foster chaos. We pray this morning for all mired in situations that victimize whole groups of races, situations in which brutality is commonplace and random. We pray this morning for all who struggle against despair or dark forces within themselves, against memories that linger but might be might better be let go against destructive inclinations we pray this morning for all involved in the battle with disease with difficult decisions that affect family and future with pains of loss that divert attention from life's fullness we pray this morning for all who struggle to enact their fondest hopes for a more humane and just world to use abilities to the utmost, 
to build the church into a community of caring and compassion. For all these persons, we ask the strengthening of your spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, ally of those who struggle and Savior who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you join me in our next hymn? Now thank we all our God, number 102. Please be seated. Our first reading this morning will be from Jeremiah 31, 15th verse. Thus saith the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Would you all stand for the gospel reading? This is from Matthew 1, the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to demiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are name him Jesus." For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill <clears throat> what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophets. 
Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took his child and his mother by night and went to Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophets. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's that weird time of year where we just had Thanksgiving and all at once here we are celebrating Christmas. It sneaks up on us. Advent is a almost like a sneaky thing, and all once, here it is. Even though the stores go automatically from Halloween to Christmas, the day after Christmas, after Halloween. So Thanksgiving doesn't even get a chance then. And usually at Christmas time, preachers spend a lot of time talking about Jesus' miraculous conception. That's what it's all about. And the virgin birth leads you and I to think about the fact that Jesus was conceived apart from any human father. So according to the scriptures, Jesus did not have a biological father. So naturally and rightly so, we focus on Jesus' heavenly father, God. But even though Jesus didn't have a biological father, he did have an earthly father, a forgotten man by many accounts. We rarely hear a message on Joseph, who really was the stepfather of Jesus. And I've spoken on Joseph before because I feel like he gets left out. Most of the time we're talking about Mary, the mother of God, the mother of Jesus. But Jesus' dad was quite a man, and he gets overlooked mostly at Christmas time. So today I want to talk about this forget, forgotten father of Christmas. And even though he gets overlooked, doesn't mean that we should underestimate what he has to teach us. Can you imagine the halls of heaven when God had to pick out a man to be the earthly father of Jesus? Now God's got this list of every man on earth, and he needs to pick out somebody. I guess if nobody was available, he could have resurrected somebody. But he chose Joseph, a simple carpenter. Of all the men God had to choose, his top pick on the list was Joseph. So why? Why did God chose Joseph to be Jesus' human father? See if this makes any sense to you. There's lots of things going on here. I think it's for the same reason that he chose Abraham to be the father of many nations. If you look back in Genesis, the 18th chapter, it says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known in him in order that he may command his children and household after him, that they keep the way of righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. 
God said, I know the kind of man that Abraham is. If I ask him to do something, I have the confidence in him that he's going to do it. And I believe God chose Joseph for the same reason. God knew the kind of man that Joseph was. He knew that if he asked Joseph to do something, he would do it. And he knew he was going to need that kind of man. And not only would Joseph do it himself, he'd make sure his children and his entire household would do it as the best that he could. If you notice in Matthew, it says in verses 1 and 2 at the very beginning of the gospel, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of God, the son of Abraham, Abraham begot Isaac, and I won't read all of them because it goes on for 16 verses. And it finishes up this genealogy by saying, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, who of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So Joseph's family tree goes all the way back to Abraham, and that's a lot of generations. If I understand it correctly, there are 14 generations from Jesus back to the exile in Babylon. Then there's 14 generations back to David. Then there's 14 generations back to Abraham. Now that's 42 generations. And I thought I did real good tracing my family tree back 10 generations, but I didn't do that great. So I think that just as Matthew makes this family connection between Joseph and Abraham, there's a close connection to the type of men they were. So God chose Joseph because he knew Joseph would obey. And Joseph is an ex ex amazing example of the obedience to the will and the word of God. And we can learn a lot from Joseph about obedience. I want to share with you some things that Joseph shows us, shows us some practical things that we can learn from this human father of Jesus Christ. If you think of Christmas as a movie, you might think of Joseph as a character in that movie. <clears throat> and I'm sure you've watched a lot of traditional Christmas movies over the years. And already this year, let's see, we've watched Polar Express. We've watched uh, Christmas Vacation. We watch How the Grinch Stole Christmas which is what our Bible study is all about on Wednesday night in a book called <clears throat> A Heart That Grew Three Sizes. And let's see, last night we watched, uh, wasn't Rudolph, who was it? It was Robbie the Reindeer. Yeah, me and Malachi had to watch Robbie the Reindeer. So we're catching up on our Christmas movies already. Every movie's got leading roles and supporting roles, leading men and women in the movie. Well, most people look at Joseph in the story and say he's almost like an extra in the movie rather than a leading man. And the reason is because Joseph never speaks at all in the entire story. Joseph in Matthew and in Luke never is recorded as having a speaking part. He doesn't get a line. I watched the movie Four Christmases a few years ago. I don't know if you've seen that one. But in the movie, the couple that's supposed to play Mary and Joseph in the Christmas pageant gets sick, and they don't show up. So they ask uh, the, part, the people played by Renee, Renee Witherspoon and Vince Vaughn to play the parts. And Kate, played by Witherspoon, forgets her lines as Mary. And so Joseph, played by Vince Vaughn, he jumps in and he tells a whole long story which Joseph doesn't say, and uh, it's not what anybody was counting on. So if you get a chance to see that, it's f a funny part. But I'm afraid in the Bible, Joseph doesn't get a speaking part. And because Joseph isn't speaking, it's, it's easy to assume that he's kind of unimportant to the story. But I want you to notice how significant that he is to the entire story as it develops. When you and I read the gospel accounts of the first Christmas, even though we don't hear Joseph, we see him. 
He doesn't talk. He acts. He's a man of action. As you and I read the Christmas story, we see God talking to Joseph three or four times through his angels. How many people do you know that God has spoken to with his angels three or four times? Not very many. We see Joseph listening to God speaking. We see Joseph moving his family from one location to another. And that's a little more complicated than jumping in the van and heading down the highway. We see Joseph struggling with his conscience and his personal fears about what to do with Mary now that she's discovered she's pregnant. And rather than listen to Joseph, you and I end up watching him. Think about it. Watch how he responds to Mary's confession. Watch how he responds to an angel appearing to him in a dream. Watch what he does when he wakes up from the dream. Watch where he goes and who he takes with him. We end up watching Joseph act rather than listen to him speak. And I don't think any of this is by accident. I I believe God cast Joseph in this role for a reason. One of the more important things that he teaches us is that actions speak louder than words. Joseph may have been a quiet man. He may have been a man of few words, and that's maybe why he's not recorded speaking at all. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is recorded speaking seven times in the New Testament. And somehow we think it's a whole lot more than that. Zachariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, Mary's cousin, are recorded as speaking. Simeon, the old man who who was promised by God that he would not die before he saw Jesus, is recorded as speaking. Even the angel Gabriel has several speaking parts. But not Joseph. But Joseph doesn't need to speak to hear him. You know, there's an old saying that goes, you're speaking so loudly, I can't hear what you say. I used to feel that way at meetings at work. Mike's smiling. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. Someone talks and goes on and on and on. And after a while, I just tune them out. And I'm somewhere else. And Carolyn gets mad at me when I do that. (laughs) Joseph, his character and his actions spoke for themselves. And his life preached a better sermon than words ever would. He was a man of action, a man of obedience. In Matthew 1, the 18th, it says, and we heard this earlier, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. As his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. And then in verse 24 through 25, then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph doesn't speak a word. He thinks, he sleeps, he dreams, he listens, and he obeys by marrying Mary and naming the baby Jesus. His actions speak loudly. Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, doubted and denied the command of God. And God made him mute until John was born. Mary responded with a question to the angel when he appeared to her. But Joseph simply got up and wed Mary. It's kind of like Nike. Just do it. No games, 
no gimmicks. Just do it. Just obey God for what he asks of you. Now, he obeyed God, but it doesn't mean he wasn't afraid. When the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, he said to Joseph, Do not be afraid to take you, Mary, to take for you, marry your wife. Now, don't you think at this point in his life, Joseph is really scared? Okay, if you're sleeping tonight and an angel speaks to you, you might be a little bit afraid. I know I would. But think about Joseph. He's just become engaged to Mary. And then he learns the unthinkable. His beautiful bride is expecting a baby. And Mary says to him, Joe, guess what happened? An angel appeared to me and said the Holy Spirit caused me to be pregnant. You believe me, don't you? For you teachers out there, it'd be kind of like a student telling his teacher, the dog ate my homework. Who's going to believe that? And Joseph also felt the pressure from the, the rabbis in the first century who required that a woman like Mary should be divorced. So Joseph is hanging in this imbalance, going back and forth with two options, divorce her or marry her. And divorce at that time applied to the engagement. What he feels he ought to do and what he wants to do. But God intervenes and tells Joseph that what Mary's saying is true. God has indeed caused her to conceive. And so you have Joseph with this internal struggle within his heart. And then his actions speak louder than words. What do his actions say? They say, I believe you, God. I trust God's word, though I'm afraid I will trust in him. Is that what we do when we're afraid? Do we trust him? Do you obey despite your fears? Actions speak louder than words. And God really very, isn't very impressed with our words, but with our actions. You know, in Matthew 25, he doesn't say, go out and talk to the people that are hungry or naked or in prison. He says, you better feed them. You better clothe them. You better visit them. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Obeying God's will always has immediate personal consequences. We may not know what that obedience will mean for us when we first make that decision to obey. In our scripture this morning, there's a strange, strange story that really comes at the end of Christmas. The text is commonly called The Slaughter of the Innocents. And that doesn't sound like a movie you'd have on with the kids in the room. We don't usually tell or like this part of the Christmas story. It's really rarely preached upon, even though once a year, every three years, it shows up in our church lectionary at Christmas time. You will never see this story on a Christmas card or see it acted out in a Christmas pageant. We do sing and talk about the wise men. We act that out. Even though that probably took place at least when Jesus was a year older, if not older, but we always cut the story short. We do not include this episode, even though it's what happened here is the direct result, the direct consequence of the wise men visit. But we tend to leave it out. Well, good grief, as Charlie Brown would say, it's too harsh. It's too gory. Mass murder in Jesus? 
Mary and Joseph and the re are refugees running for their lives. This is not part of our holiday picture that we like. But here they are. Right here is in Matthew telling the tale. And those who protest this violence are right. There's no more gory, bloody, violent scene in the New Testament except probably the crucifixion. The slaughter of the innocents the flight to Egypt. What are we to make of this part of the tale? Why did Matthew include it in the story? Luke left it out. There's theological interpretations that try to explain why Matthew included this. Um, you know, you think about here we have a pharaoh, we have children, the land of Egypt, slaughter. Sounds a lot of like the Exodus story. Sounds a lot like Moses' story. The stories of Jacob and Joseph, Moses, Pharaoh, and the Exodus. But it's clear that Matthew wants to portray Jesus as kind of a second Moses who delivers and frees his people. He connects the story of Jesus with the Exodus. Matthew makes another connection here and refers back to Jeremiah, which Mike read earlier with Rachel weeping for her children. That's the reference to the exile in Babylon when the town of Ramah, which is just a few miles south of Bethlehem, that's a traditional burial place of Rachel, the wife of Jacob, the father of the 12 sons. But it became a special place because 500, 1,000 years later, that's when the exile occurred with the Jews being deported to Babylon by Neb uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's soldiers rounding them up and sending them in chains. So Matthew, by quoting Jeremiah, makes a connection of the story with the exile. Jesus, who's now going to be in exile, a refugee far, far from home. We begin to understand the story that Matthew tells of Jesus has something to do with the Old Testament. And he connects the story of the exodus and the exile to Jesus, the two main stories in Israel's history. So why do we shy away from this story? Maybe we don't like the idea that the Holy Family were immigrants fleeing violence in their country like so many people at our southern border. Maybe we don't like it the way the Bible commands us to take care of the foreigner. Maybe we don't tell this part of the story because the tale is too true to life. Maybe we'd rather stay longer holding our candles aloft and a beautiful night singing Silent Night of what we're going to do here on Christmas Eve at 10 o'clock. After all, why should we have the be so quickly wrenched away from the serenity of Bethlehem and flung into this story of mass murder and escape. Why can't Christmas be all sweetness and light? Why does Matthew have to mess it up with this story of Herod? Why do we have to deal with him? Well, the truth is, when Jesus is born in Bethlehem, Herod wakes up in Jerusalem six miles away. The good news always has enemies. And wherever you go in this world, the contest is always the same. It's the King Herod's, the rich of the world in Jerusalem, versus King Jesus, the poor in Bethlehem. And it's often a bloody contest. When Joseph decided to obey God and wed Mary, he didn't know that that, that was going to mean he was going to have to leave Bethlehem and take his family to Egypt. Jesus didn't know, uh, Joseph didn't know he was going to spend some nights on the road, anxious, worrying that Herod's army was going to find him. Joseph didn't know that obeying God would mean that he would have to settle in Nazareth rather than Bethlehem. Your obedience may set you on a collision course. And evil will do everything it can to redirect you from following God. Obedience does have a cost. 
but so does disobedience. Not to obey the will of God carries a high price. Can you imagine what Joseph would have lost if he didn't obey the will of God? He would have lost his integrity. The Bible says Joseph was a just man and not willing to make her a public example. But it isn't just bad men and women who disobey God. It's good men and women most of the time. Don't you know good men and women who have been derailed in life because they decided to follow their own desires rather than God's will for them? How many times do we hear of a business or an organization that has been embezzled by what they thought was a good employee? Think about the role Joseph was playing. He's the earthly father of Jesus Christ. What greater responsibility could you have? And he's charged with this great responsibility of being an earthly father for Jesus. And what a parent he was. Look at the way Jesus turned out. Okay, he's got the heavenly father, but he sees his earthly father every day, and he modeled his life after Joseph also. You know, if you want your son, what you want your son or daughter to be, that's what you need to try to be. Be, exam- be a good example on how a person should live. When Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done, I think he was reflecting somewhat on what he saw Joseph doing. Joseph didn't worry about his will. He worried about God's will time and time again, that he obeyed God. Anything and everything God ever told him to do, he simply followed God's instructions. I'll leave you with this thought. If our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ could follow Joseph's example, I think it makes sense that you and I can benefit from following his example also. This Christmas, don't forget Joseph. Remember him. Follow his example. Obey God and live a life that someone else can follow. Amen. We come to that time in our service where we normally take up our offering. The offering plates are in the narthex. And right now we will have a special music offertory. Thank you. 
please stand for our doxology. Please join me in our prayer of dedication. Mighty and all-knowing God, who sees us as we are, as we might be, what offering can we give that will bring you joy? We have brought gifts this morning that you might dedicate them to the work of caring and compassion in our neighborhoods, in our nation, and throughout the world. Yet all the money we have can accomplish what you can make happen if we simply let Christ dwell in our hearts. This is the offering we dedicate this day. In Christ, our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Okay, we have a closing hymn here, number 215, To a Maid Engaged to Joseph, which I don't think any of you probably ever sang. And so I've asked Darren to play it through one time so we can hear it. And then we will give it our all after that. But it's a perfect hymn for Joseph and the beginning of Advent.
You all did really good on that. <laughs> and now may the peace of God and the God of peace be and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.